Happy Sabbath. I'm so happy this morning because there's some new faces I haven't um, seen before and some old faces that I have missed and I'm so happy to see them today. And so I praise God for um, being with you, for bringing you into our house of worship today. And before we get into the sermon today, I I need to recognize someone who's been so good to our church. He's been faithful in the services he's um, given the church. Actually, more faithful than some of us here. Comes on time, and he does what he's required to well. And I believe that God has also blessed his ministry in many ways. Fortunately, he has to leave us, but we want to tell him how much we appreciate him. Talking about Jason. Jason, come up. And it is important to let people know when they've done well to recognize them. It's true that we may not be able to repay you fully all the things you've done, you know, for our church. But I do believe that the Lord will bless you in many ways. And so today, we're not saying goodbye. We're just saying, we're just sending you with a blessing, knowing that you're already part of us. And we are your family. We know that um, you're also part of us. And today, I'm going to Before I give you something, just a token of appreciation that we've prepared for you, I would like you, if you have something, you know, to say to your dear family, you could, you have the time now to do so. Amen. I'm I'm gonna be like uh, my church. I won't be before you long. Um, But before I just before this is not the end, I just want to. I know this is the last. I'm, this is not the last time you will see me. Let me clear the record for that. Amen. But um, before uh, I know some of this may seem like it's the end, but before I get to the end, I need to get to be the beginning Amen. of when I first came here. And it's probably almost two years ago when I first got here. And honestly, I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how um, how, how you're going to take me in, considering that I came from a different denomination and a, and a different background church-wise. I didn't know how you were going to take me in. But when I first got here, I didn't see SDA. I saw L-O-V-E. The love that was shared and the... the time that we spent and y'all welcomed me with open arms and I never forgot that to this day of when I first got here continue that everybody you see welcome every visitor here you see welcome them with open arms continue in love continue in faith continue in unity never let that Never let that part from this church. Amen. Amen. You're only better together. You only can go forward together. So let love continue. Amen. Because the Bible says, and this is Bible, God is love. And if you want to show the love of God to others, continue in love. 
even even after I'm even after I'm quote unquote not here. Like I said, I will be back. But even at, even even in the times that I'm not here, continue that love, continue that devotion. Amen. My 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 prayer desires is that that you will grow not just in numbers, but grow in grace, grow in God. Let him lead you. Let him guide you. And uh, like I tell, tell people, when you stop telling God what you cannot do, you'll be amazed at what God can do. Amen. So continue in God. God bless you. I, I love each and every one of you. Some that I talk to all the time and some I just say hi and bye to. I love y'all. God bless y'all. Go forward in Christ. In this, in this big bag, <laughs> it seems like that you know there are a lot, a lot of stuff in here, but I put together something that I want to discover afterward. Gotcha. But there is a very nice picture of you and the love. You know, when you see that picture, you just know how much you know. Um, integrated you were with us or you are with us and another one is a book that I believe that will help you to know what's ahead and so in your walk toward heaven if you read you know the, 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 the writings of this book you will also be blessed so that you can share that also with others and there is something else I want you to discover later on gotcha. let's pray that he will um, Continue to grow in love and continue his ministry um, in your church, wherever you go. And I know that you will be back. Yes. You will be back. Yeah. So let's praise God again for Jason. Amen. Now, Let's bow our head for prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, you bring people in our lives for a reason. And I know that whatever we do, wherever we go, once we have that love that you have and you've given us, to show to others we we'll truly be called your children and today I would like to pray in a special way for Jason the Lord you will bless his family that you will bless his work that you will bless his ministry but that is not just gonna be a ministry for him but a ministry that will lead him to grow closer to you every day. And so, Lord, I pray that wherever he goes, that you're going to be with him. Whatever he's learned in this church, that you will deepen his knowledge. So, Lord, his time here will be a blessing to him as well as it has been a blessing to us. I pray now that our people, our children here at OIC, as we now tune our heart to listen to your word, that your spirit will descend, that you will talk to us today as we deal with a very important topic, unpardonable sin. Speak to us, Lord. Convict us and guide us into all truth. This I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. 
verses 30 through 32. Matthew chapter 12, verses 30 through 32. It reads, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. The Bible says, he who is not with me is against me. And many people in the world today, they think they can have it both ways. I can be with the Lord, and I can also be with the world. It cannot be. There's no middle ground. The Lord says, if you're not with me, then you're against me. And he continues. Verse 31. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven man. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. The unpardonable sin. The sin against the Holy Spirit. What is it all about? We've been talking about the Holy Spirit throughout the whole month of January. We saw how it is important for us to need the Holy Spirit because without Him, there is no true revival. And without revival, there is no reformation. Without Him... God can all work through us. And now, if Christ says, if you sin against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven you, then that's very important. You see, any sin that isn't covered means death to the sinner. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. So every sin that isn't covered in this life means death to you and I. That's the reason why Christ came in the first place. To cover our sin. To cover our shamefulness. 1 John 3 verse 4 says... How does the Bible define sin? Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Other versions say is sin is a transgression of the law. But another understanding or definition of sin... Sin is also a condition of the heart. Sin is a condition of a human heart. In Matthew chapter 15, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew 15. We'll be reading from verse 19. What does the Bible say? Matthew 15, 19. Are you there? The Bible says, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Out of where? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. And you know that we're not talking about the heart, Kokoro, in Japanese. It's talking about the the mind. Why? Because in Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7, Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7, the Bible says you don't think with the heart. You think with your mind. 
It says, for as he thinks in the heart, so is he. And so what Christ is talking about is out of your mind. Because everything starts here. Murders. Fornications. You see, as long as we are in this world, as long as we have this sinful nature, we'll have evil thoughts. Because constantly, every day, we are bombarded by evil thoughts. As someone said, you cannot stop the birds to fly over your head, can you? You cannot. But you can stop them from making a nest over your hair. And so thoughts, evil thoughts will come. But they do not stay there. You should not let them remain there. You need to kick them out. And how do you do that? You can't do that by yourself. Through the Holy Spirit. By the power of God, you can kick those evil thoughts from your mind. Some people say, Well, I got into this trouble and I wasn't thinking. I don't know what I was thinking when I cheated on my wife. I don't know what I was thinking when I was driving drunk. Is that correct? Of course not. Because before you commit a act, before you do something, You've had time to think about it, convince yourself, and then you do it. No such thing as, I wasn't thinking. Everything starts here. It depends on how you let that thought grow and becomes an action that you commit. And so in our sinful nature, as I said, we will always have evil thoughts but we can resist them we can resist them by the power of God the Bible says out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murder you know some people think you have to kill someone in order to be called a murderer but the Bible is clear that even if you hate someone you are a murderer. It's unfortunate that some of us today have those kind of feeling toward others. Out of where? The heart, the mind. Think about someone you don't like. You are a murderer. Fornication. You don't have to be to commit the act before being judged or condemned or for it to become a sin. But just looking at someone, a woman, a man, lustfully is also sin. It's fornication. And today you can actually go beyond that. Watching it on TV is also fornication. God's will for every believer is to overcome sin. But if God wants us to overcome sin, he also has provided the power to overcome it. And so some, when people say, well, um, I cannot overcome this, then what we're saying is, God is not powerful enough to overcome this sin in my life. What we actually saying when someone says, I don't know why I kept on cheating on my wife. The problem is not the person, is not God, it's not about the sin, but it is. The problem is that the person doesn't want to stop cheating. It's a decision you make. Being faithful is, doesn't come by, you know, by, um, by magic. 
It's a decision you make every single day to be faithful to your partner. The question is, do you want to do the will of God? Because if you want to do it, God will give you the power to overcome it. I know what I'm talking about. Some of us, we've been there, struggling with something in our lives, but we've asked God in prayer, and God has given the power to overcome it. He says, if you want to be cleansed from all your sin, the Lord wants you to confess them. You know the things you're struggling with, and God knows it. But unless you confess them to the Lord, He cannot cleanse you. Jesus says, Come now, Isaiah 1.18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Can you imagine God? The holy God is calling us and say, come, let's talk about it. Let's reason together. Let's look at this that you're struggling with and see what we can do about it. God is saying, you know, if you continue in that sin, you're not going to make it. So come, let's talk about it because I have a plan for you. I have a plan to, to make you get out of that situation. And many people don't want to reason with the Lord. They don't want to actually listen to what the Lord is saying. What is the unpardonable sin? Some people have tried to look for that sin. Is it when someone kills his mother? Is it when a parent kills his child? Is that the unpardonable sin? Is it when someone puts a bomb somewhere and kills many people? Is that the unpardonable sin? And some people have lowered it down to suicide. That the unpardonable sin is suicide. And it's, it might be true, but I don't think it is true. Because yes, if you kill yourself, you won't have any chance to repent. But the Bible talks about one judge that committed suicide. Who am I talking about? Do you know who I'm talking about? There was one judge in the Bible who committed suicide. Samson, thank you. Samson committed suicide. He literally killed himself. Though it was not his own will, he asked the Lord. And he was recorded among the man of faith. In Hebrews. And so yes. You can look at that. But do not try it. Don't kill yourself and think. Because Samson did it. You're also going to be called. You know put in. You know um, among the men of faith. He asked the Lord. It was God's will. He gave up his life. To kill the Philistines. Why are we going through this? Because the just shall live by faith. Without faith, we cannot please God, the Bible says. And so, if anything you do without faith, the Bible says, is sin. Anything you do and you know that it's wrong is sin. There was a story told of a young lady in Japan forgot from which, uh, which um, prefecture, I think Mie prefecture. She was tired of life. She didn't 
look at life with a future. She had no hope. She didn't have a purpose for her life. And she went around asking, asking for help. One day, she was found dead in a park. A young man just killed her. And he was there with the body. When everybody came, the police came, they arrested him. They asked him, why did you kill this young lady? The young man said, high school. He said, I did what she asked me to. She asked me to kill her. Because she was tired of life. And she went around asking you know, her classmates, just kill me, kill me, kill me. And everyone refused. And she was looking for something worth living for. But no one could, could, could give it to her. And so the boy said, since I also didn't have anything to give to her, worth living for. I answered her call. And I relieved her from her pain. That's why I killed her. It was not my will. It was her will. I was doing her a favor. Is that the unpardonable sin? Many people out there looking for a reason to live for. Many people are killing themselves because they lost faith. Because they lost hope. So if you kill yourself because you have no hope, there's nothing we can do. Samson did not kill himself because he lost hope. It was the opposite. And so suicide is not the unpardonable sin. But let's get into the types of sin. We have two types of sin. How many? Two types of sin. So the first one is sin of omission. Everybody? Sin of omission. Omission is simple. You just decide to omit what the Lord has, to, uh, has told you to do. You just choose, oh, well, I'm going to do this, but this one, I ain't going to do it. Sin of omission. You know it, but you choose not to do it. The second one is a sin of commission. Everyone? Sin of commission. When you commit to do wrong. You know, many people are going to go, are, are going to be lost. Not because they were very bad people. Many people will be lost that were loving, caring, um, faithful to their spouse, good fathers and mothers. They never stole. They never committed adultery. They never committed murder. And so on forth and so forth. But just because they said, well, I'm just going to be good here, but then this one, just this one thing, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Some will be lost just because they decided to omit to do what was right. In the same way that many will be lost because they committed to do wrong. And you have people like that today. Some people, they just decide, I don't want to do right. I just want to do my own thing. And that's their philosophy. Some people, they are really good. They are really good people out there. But it's still the same thing, that you decide not to know, not to do what you know is right. And so in Matthew, in Romans chapter 2, 
verse 13. Paul says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. It's not about, yes, I know the truth. Yes, I know the Bible, you know, from cover to cover. But no, are you doing what the Bible says? Are you doing what the Lord reveals to you? The Lord says, my people are destroyed, are perishing because of lack, because of lack of knowledge, ignorance. And the Bible says they will be judged. So even though you decide, well, I do not want to know, you also will be judged because of that. Some people choose not to know. That's also a decision. The doers of the law are called just. And so, brothers and sisters, as we come every Sabbath, as we read our Bibles, as we discover new light every day, it, is, it does nothing to us if we know it, but we are not practicing it. How many things we know? How many good things do we know? Yet, we find ourselves not doing it. Just because. We just don't want to do it. We have no excuses to continue doing what displeases God. Because God said, if you choose to do my will, I will supply the power that you need to do it. You can't do God's will on your own. That's already something that we already established. But if you choose to do his will, you will have the power to do so. The question is, do you want to? Last week, we, we talked about you searching for what is right. Searching the will of God in every aspect of your life. Sometimes we choose not to know more. This week, my brother sent me um, an article. It was about soy products. I'm vegetarian, so um, I consume a lot of soy products. And he was telling me, um, who are those, you know, drinking soy milk and all this stuff? And he said, it is not good. You need to stop. I'm like, what are you talking about? He sent this stuff. For a while, I wanted to just say, you know what? I don't want to read it. I don't want to know. Because once you know what you do with that truth, it's all up to you. And you'll be judged. You'll be, you know, you'll be held accountable for it. I won't tell you what he said about soy products, but if that's true, if that's true, then we have a problem, right? And God will tell me, go back to meat. But the whole issue is, how do you react when someone shares the truth with you? Do you close the door? Do you listen and go back and study for yourself? When the word is preached here, do you go home and go through it? Sometimes you don't even take notes. All this, you don't take notes. So, Probably when you go home, you don't actually get the chance to go through the Bible text that we gave. Because you need to review it. You need to go through it. To affirm that truth. It's not what the pastor says, but what the Bible says. Many times, in some other denominations, the Bible is read once, it's been closed, and the rest of the sermon... It's just about one person's idea. How do you double check those if you don't have the references from the Bible? Do we come to church to learn, to study? You've got to do so because truth needs to be nurtured. And so... Jesus' blood can cleanse all sins. 
the Bible says, except one. The one against the Holy Spirit. And so, these are three kinds of people. What we usually do. People sin out of or through ignorance. There are many people in the world today. They sin and they don't actually know that what they are doing is wrong. And God says something about it. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Open your Bibles. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts 17, 30. If you there, say amen. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Amen. So he says, truly, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere, not only in Japan, not only in Africa, everywhere to do what? To repent. Yes, there was a time you overlooked everything we did because we didn't know. Pastor, Pastor C.D. Brooks says, God winked at it. He saw you, you don't do it, but he just winked. Overlooked it. And I know that when you don't know something, God overlooks it. But once you know, the Bible says now he calls you, he commands you to repent. Once you know that this is not right, repent. Don't say, well, let me think about it. Oh, let, let me give myself two years to reform myself before I start doing what is right. Time is of the essence. Do you know what is coming tomorrow? Do you know if you'll be alive in 30 minutes from now? Nobody knows. If you don't repent now. The future is uncertain. And so, there's a time that you didn't know something. That's why God sent some of us to tell you the things you need to know. And so, every time you come to church, you're exposing yourself to know more and do something about it. And that's why we're here. That's why we want to share the things you don't know. So that you can know and do something about it before Christ comes. It's not just to come in the house of God, worship, fellowship, but it's also to know what I need to do to make it right with the Lord. The second people, we sin out of passion. Does that tell you something? We sin out of passion. We are so overwhelmed and we start seeing stuff that I'm not good. And sometimes, many of the saints are guilty of this. You know, some people can really get on your nerve, you know? Really. They can really upset you. Though they're godly people, they can upset you. And someone said, they can really go on your last nerve. But what do you do when that happens? God understands. That some people, yes, they sin out of passion. They're passionate about something. They're passionate about their, you know, their wife, their kids. You do something, they go and they beat you up. It's wrong. But it's just the passion, the overwhelming you know, um, emotion that makes them do those things. Remember Peter? When those soldiers came to arrest Jesus Christ, what did he do? Took a knife and just cut the ear off. Passion. Did Christ say something to him? Christ understood. It was an act of passion. Yes, it's wrong. I'm not saying, yes, be passionate and just sit around. No, no, no. But what I'm saying is, there are degrees. God understands that. You cannot be passionate all the time. But when that happens, when you know at home, 
You've said something to your wife, and she's she gone like, you know, all crazy. And you know you've done wrong. What do you do? See what I'm saying? Come in aside. I'm sorry. Some don't. They want to stand for themselves. They want to prove that they are, you know, they're in control. But once you know you're wrong, ask for forgiveness. Repent. And I believe that once you do that right there, the person will also melt. But when you don't, you know what's next. The third is people sin deliberately. They do it willfully. They know what they're doing. And I think this is the worst. We cannot say this sin is lesser than the other one, but when you look at it, when somebody sins out of ignorance, you understand. Out of passion, you understand. But when somebody does it, Deliberately, that is something that God does not take. David, he went so far away from God because of what he's done. Yet in this psalm, Psalm 19 verse 13, he says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Keep those deliberate sins I commit. Keep them away from me, because I do not want to be guilty of those, he says, great transgressions. What are the things in your life you know that are wrong? But you do it. You do them anyway. Don't tell me. Think about them. If David understood this, the presumptuous sins, deliberate sins, are the worst. That we need to keep those sins away. Then we need also to learn from him. We need to learn from him. You know, sometimes we tend to forget how privileged we are. In Numbers 15, it says, But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. The Bible is not saying if you sin presumptuously, deliberately, you will make it to heaven. It says, you shall be cut off. That's serious. Serious, friends. And when, that, when you go through this, you ask yourself, am I doing something? I know. But if I don't change, I'm not going to make it. And I believe each and every one of us, we're doing something somewhere that is not right. We need to start changing. Presumptuously, according to the commentaries, with a high hand, with open disdain for the will and the work of God. This is a sin that is done, as it were, while looking God in the eye and shaking one, you know, one's fist at him. Like you look at God and you say, you do it without any... Respect, or I would say, any fear. The Lord is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. When you make that decision to sin, even though He is there, to sin in His house, 
to sin. We should ask ourselves how God feels. And this is a text that it troubles me because my dad is one of these people. Paul says, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 says, For it is, what? Impossible. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away. After all this, if they fall away, if they decide to leave the church, if they decide to forget about God, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Do you understand this? If you have known the truth, if you have accepted Christ, if you have tasted how good the Lord is, how good His Word is, and has experienced it, if after all this, you decide to leave the Lord, Paul says, it is possible, right? It is possible to renew. Is that what he's saying? It's impossible. And so, yeah, my dad, he knows everything. It's not a matter of Bible study. Now, some people, you can give Bible study all day long, but they will not because they already know it. All we can do for these people is to pray that they decide again to come back to the Lord because they know what they do. Could it be that here we have also people like that? That after all you've learned, it's possible for you to decide to leave the faith. Not to do what the Lord asks you to do. Paul continues and says, um, in Acts chapter 7, 51, says, You stiff necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Some of us despise the Word of God. When it tells us to do things we don't want to do, we despise it. We don't want to listen. We don't want to understand. We choose not to understand. I remembered one man, Japanese man, was giving Bible study to. But he has been there for like 12 years he was studying. 12 years studying the Word of God. Yet... He didn't make a decision for Christ. But finally, he decided to join, I mean, to accept Christ as his personal savior. It was unbelievable, but we knew that God works in many ways. But there's some people for 20 years studying the same Bible over and over again. And they resist the Holy Spirit. They resisted. Not today. Not tomorrow. No, not now. No, not, not this year. Resisting, resisting, and resisting. The Bible tells us if you continue resisting the Holy Spirit, when it tells you, don't go there. He said, no, I will go. Don't do that. No, I will do. There will come a time when there's nothing we can do. Why is this sin so serious? Why is it so serious, the sin against the Holy Spirit? Understand that Jesus 
the darling, the beloved son of God, left heaven. He came down here. He suffered great pain for you and I. He remained here. He bore the humiliation we gave upon him. The betrayal and horrible death. Because he wanted to make a way for everyone willing to be saved. If after, if after all this, you reject him, what other way is there for you? That's why serious it is. It hurts the Holy Spirit because Christ said, I'm going and I, I have to go because you need the comforter to lead you, to guide you. He will be a witness of me. If the Holy Spirit is convicting us every single day and we keep on rejecting him and rejecting him, as we read before, it's like we are crucifying Christ afresh every single time. We are rejecting his grace and his sacrifice. There's nothing left for us. If after all this, we decide, we decide to reject the Holy Spirit, it will be like when David understood that no, I need the Holy Spirit. I need to be in his presence. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your spirit from me. Because it's your spirit that convicts me of sin. Do not take it away. I will end with this story. Suppose. Suppose. That there was a man who fell in love with a beautiful lady. He went up to her and told her how he felt about her. As for a date, she accepted. The day was set. He bought his best gift, went up to the house, knocked at the door. She opened up the door, and there was Mr. James in the couch, somebody else, broken-hearted. He leaves, asks the question, why did she have somebody else when we already had an appointment? And she accepted to go out with me. Why is somebody else in her house? She calls him up during the week and says, I'm sorry, we had an appointment, but I forgot about it. Um, it. It won't happen again. How about next Sunday? Can we come together again? He gets his hopes back, gets ready, comes again with a gift. Next time he knocks again, he, she opens up, and this time it's John in the couch. But this time you should understand that this lady is not serious, right? But then he goes back broken, says, what is she doing with my heart? She's just hurting me over and over. And she calls him again, with that nice voice and tells him, I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Give me one more chance. He goes again. It's how much we do crazy things when you're in love. He go again, he goes again, and there, he knocks, hoping this time, finally, I can have a quality time with my beloved. She opens up. This time it's Peter. At this time, 
as a wise and probably normal guy, what do you do? Do you go back again? No. By this time, you would have understood that this lady cannot be a faithful wife. There's nothing else he could have done. And he decides to leave her alone. And get your heart taken care of by someone else. This is the kind of story that I personally experienced. I'm not going to tell you everything today, but three times. And I was like, no, this is it. She's gone too far. I can't go back. This, uh, there's a point of time when you know that the person has crossed the line. You can't go back. The same thing happens with us with the Holy Spirit. You say no, 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 no. He will keep on calling up, you know. He will keep on talking to you, talking to you. But there is a time when you quench the Holy Spirit. You can hear him anymore. That's the unpardonable sin. Because you can't repent anymore. Because you have quenched the Spirit in your life. As we end, the Lord spoke to the first people that inherited the earth. The people before the flood. He said, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. If you continue to do it, the things you know that are wrong, I don't have to tell you, you know them over and over, again and again. The Spirit continues to talk to you and you say, no, let me do my way. No, leave me alone. Keep on doing it. The Lord says, my Spirit shall not strive with you forever. The question is, what do you want? This fire. This fire in the house. Everything on earth is going down the path of destruction. Christ says, the sin that is in your life will not take you to heaven. You gotta make a decision. I'm at the door. Why would you stay in while you know that it's death? Why would you decide to die when I've already given up everything? I died for you. You don't have to, to go through that again. All you need to do, accept my call. Accept the truth when you have it. Live the truth. Seek it. Because I will always reveal it to you. What do you do? Postponing Sabbath after Sabbath to accept the Lord. Why the wait? Yes. Some may say, I'd rather have my little sin than have Jesus. I'd rather have my job than have Jesus. I'd rather have my concubines than just have Jesus. I'd rather have my career and break the Sabbath but have Jesus. I'd rather have my movies than have Jesus. What is it in your life? I'd rather just be part of this family, but just be really part of it. The Spirit is talking today. I don't know who he's talking to, but he's talking to all of us. 
And I believe that each and every one of us, we have something in our lives that we need to repent from. The decision is not tomorrow. The decision is now. And I, the car is to come up. What else could God do if we reject Him? He can't. I'd rather have world fame but have Jesus. But I'm going to sin the opposite. I'd rather have Jesus than anything in this world. Amen? I'd rather have Jesus and whatever the world is offering me. That's my prayer for all of us today. And I hope that as we sing this song, that you will meditate upon the words and make a commitment in your heart with the Lord today. Not tomorrow. Today. Amen.